You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R.com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts. Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management, along with Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian and Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That music means we are back. It is time to commence another broadcast week here. On the old Options Insider Radio Network. Yes, it is time to kick things off with our bi-weekly extravaganza known around the globe as the Option Block. Hope you folks had a great, fun Super Bowl weekend, had a fun party. Whatever you chose to do, watch the game, not watch the game, wager heavily on said game, maybe just devour a whole bunch of buffalo wings. Whatever floats your boat out there, hope you had a good weekend. My name, of course, Mark Longo from the T-H-E, OptionsInsider.com as well as from the network upon which you're going to spend all week mainline. And trust me, I know these things. (laughs) If you like what you hear, this show, anything else on the old network this week, throw a rating, a star, a comment. All of it does help at the end of the day. New people continue to discover the content. 17 years in, still going strong. You folks are the reason that is happening. So we thank all of you out there for taking the time to rate and review. And of course, all of you who also take the time to join us over there on the Pro Every Week Great pro Q&A last week with Scott Nations. Great options oddities at the end of the week as well. Congratulations to our pro member, Wolfpack, who won the February pro trading crate. Or I should say the January. You got to get your name in the hat now for the February pro trading crate. Only one place to go to do just that. The optionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go to learn more. As you go around the horn, see who's joining us on the old option block all-star panel today. I am joined by the uncle of Mike's, Mr. Uncle Mike Tussaud from St. Charles Wealth Management, as well as by the rockingest of lobsters. Yes, he loves to rock out there by himself in his lonely tower on the shores of Maine, a.k.a. Mr. Andrew Giovinazzi from OptionPit.com. I introduce them now, listeners, because it's Monday. We got to shake off maybe your uh, Super Bowl hangover. Maybe you're still recovering. Had one too many wings (laughs) yesterday. Time to get you into fine shape for the trading week with a little bit of the old 80s trivia. Here we go. All right, there we go. Let's let's uh, let's turn down the Jeopardy theme a little bit, or I should say, the uh, unlicensed trivia theme. <laughs> All right, here we go, Mr. Uncle Mike and Mr. Rock Lobster. Get your hands on your buzzers, gentlemen, because you're going to want to buzz in quick on this one. All right. In the '80s, this is all '80s trivia now. Oh, Jesus. And that was a, you, I fat fingered it. Are you busting in already before I even ask the question? I all right. Oh, you got to make him answer now. <laughs> He's got to answer. All right. Buzz. Uncle He's Mike, by answer. your own rules, you said last week you should have made me answer when I hit buzz. You hit buzz before I even asked it. So there you go. The, the world is your oyster. What is my question? You're going to regret buzzing in early, I think, I think on this one. I'm just going to go with the answer because I think you're going to do something football related. You're a Chicago themed person steve mcmichael just made it to the hall of fame so i'm going to say the answer today is steve mcmichael hmm 
interesting logic. I see what you're putting down there. Uh, the answer is not, though, Steve McMichael. So now, Mr. Rock Lobster, I think even you can answer this one. I try to craft my, my questions now in the era of the Rock Lobster so you can play, oh, too. Oh, dear. So okay. even you will be able to play in this one. But now you have free access, free reign to take your shot, sir. All right. In the 80s, there was obviously football games being played, Super Bowls being played. And there was one team, indeed, one quarterback that was dominant throughout the 80s. What quarterback won the most Super Bowls in the decade of the 1980s? Mr. Rock Lobster, uh, the floor Buzz. is yours. Buzz. Yes. I got to go Joe Montana and the yes. Niners. Yes. That, I figured even you could get this one. Yes, Joe Montana. He did win four. Uh, so a pretty dominant era. Could Got to really go back a ways, obviously, to Brady. And now looking at Mahomes winning four. Uh, or winning three. He's been in five, I believe. So, yes, uh, quite the run there for a good old Montana. He was at the game last last week, or last night, I should say. Uh, Mr. Uncle Mike, I will be charitable, since you stumbled all over yourself. I will give you a more difficult follow-up part two question, if you want, for half points, for half credit. There was a second quarterback of the 80s uh, who won not quite as many as Joe Montana, who was the quarterback after Montana who won the most Super Bowls in the 80s? Go, sir. Oh, in the 80s, I will go with... Gosh, I'm trying to figure this out. I'm going to go with um, John Elway. No, Elway was the 90s. Um... Yeah, Elway didn't win much in the 80s. I'll swear alert. <laughs> he he no, lost he to Montana not. a lot. <laughs> I can't think of anyone who won more than one. It surprised me as well. I did not think of this name until I was researching this question. And the answer for two Super Bowls is Jim Plunkett with the Raiders. He won it in 1980 with the Oakland Raiders and 1983 oh, yeah. with the Los Angeles Raiders. So there you go. Wow. I'll give you your quick I, rundown. I can't believe, like, the world is upside down because... Tucson did not answer a football question did not. properly, and I want a you football You got it. Question. You got a football question. There you go. So I, I had, like, this is upside down world. <laughs> I had to craft a question that I knew uh, the Rock Lobster could play with as well. So here's your real quick rundown of 80s Super Bowl winning QBs, listeners. Uh, 1980, Jim Plunkett with the Oakland Raiders. 1981, Montana wins his first. 82, Theisman, remember him? Washington Redskins. He had an ignominious end, obviously, at the hands of LT. 83, Jim Plunkett again with the Raiders. 84, Montana again with the Niners. 85, I wonder who won that year. Oh, yeah, McMahon and the Bears. 86, Phil Sims and the Giants, an infamous year, the year they kind of invented the pouring Gatorade, invented in air quotes, pouring Gatorade on the coach after you win. Uh, 87, Doug Williams and the Redskins, now, of course, the Washington football team. 88, Montana. 89, Montana, so you did it back-to-back. -back. And then 90, Jeff Hostetler with the Giants. So there you go. There's your rundown for 80s QBs that won the Super Bowl. As we keep on rolling into the Super Bowl of markets known as the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, listeners, did you get that one? I tried to make that one a little bit more manageable for everybody. I know the Rock Lops has got to play along, so we're kind of handicapped here. <laughs> but you probably could get that one. Everyone knows Montana. Ran rampant during the 80s out there. Let's see if the markets are running rampant. The answer is yes, if you're counting them as blowing past uh, these record levels of the 5,000 level and closing past it, which we did last week. We are continuing that threatening 5,050 right now. S&P up about 20 handles, or about 0.4%. Dow up 0.6%. NASDAQ up about 0.4% as well. All this a long way around to saying our ball friends, again, kind of picking up what we were putting down last week. They don't really seem to want to go down much below where they are right now, which is the case. Uh, VIX right now, 1360, actually at up, I should say, about half a point from where it was on the Thursday show. Uh, VVIX, 84, so back down about two points. Uh, VXX, 1420, up about 0.2, so VXX ticking back up. Uh, UVXY, 7 and a quarter, that puts it unched from the Thursday show. SVIX, 40 and a quarter, down half a point. And UVIX, at a 12 even, actually up about a tenth. Uh, a point up. I'm sorry, 11 even. <laughs> 11 even. They'll say 12 even. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> 11 even, up about a tenth of a point from where it was uh, this time last week. So a lot to unpack out there. Let's go around the horn first. As our surprise winner 
of our 80s trivia segment, The Rock Lobster Goes First. Mr. Rock Lobster, sir, what's catching your eye out there? And if you have any enduring memories of Montana in the 80s, have at it. And then B, what's catching your eye in the markets today, sir? Yes, my, my enduring memory, I went to school in UC Santa Cruz in college way back then in the 80s. Um, and, uh, you know, that was in uh, kind of Northern California, well, it, well Bay Area, and uh, during the heyday. And uh, I would go to see the Super Bowl at a, my uh, but friend from college's house. And since I was from L.A., you know, I was, you know, nominally a Rams fan. So uh, hit, my friend's dad used to make lamb. Because every time the Niners would play the Rams, it was like it, it was such such destruction. The, the difference between the L.A. Rams and the Niners in the 80s. I like <laughs> it's hard to really believe they were playing the same game, to be quite honest. I remember being a kid so growing that, up in southern New England in the 80s. I was a Pats fan. I was one of the few, and they were 1-15 and terrible before the Brady's era. And I could walk into any local drugstore in New England and buy all the Montana gear I wanted. You could not find Patriots gear anywhere because they were so bad. <laughs> but I could buy all the Niners stuff I wanted. So it's kind of like it is today. Mahomes, all the kids love Mahomes. They, they love the popular quarterback, right? But it's just funny. Uh, the era is how they have shifted, and yet somehow remain the same, sir. Yep. Yep, yep. So not not much has changed. So that was my that was my eighties. Uh but I I did have the Dodgers to lean on. So there's kind of the Dodgers Oakland A's thing was going on there for a little while, which is kind of fun. Um as far as the markets go, apparently we're taking a play out of the eighties handbook, or the I'm sorry, the the late nineties hand Wall Street handbook of the squeeze a squeeze factory. Um, so the two stocks with the lowest floats are up the most, SMCI and ARM, ARM. Now, again, I after after watching the the roaring nineties um, uh, on a front row seat, I know better than better better than to <laughs> to aggressively short these kind of names. Although both of these companies, you know, have revenue. And and they make money and they make whatever the chip stuff that everybody wants, um, you know, and at some point they'll slow down, I guess. But as of right now, I mean, they're they're pulling uh, semiconductors up uh, a ton. And, you know, that's making, uh, I believe, record highs again today, the semiconductor index. So I guess the world will be saved by semiconductors. Um and that that is the market we have. We also have this CPI number coming out tomorrow. So we have a vol futures or bid, you know, and um, uh, we have a, the number tomorrow. And, you know, in the last, I mean, for the last year, this number has provided like 10 handle or 100 handle SPX moves within two days of the number. And I don't see how that's changing tomorrow because... You know, there has been, I guess, a lot of uh, changes to the CPI calculation um, in the last year. Uh, how they calculate it, what they're calculating, all that. It's like, I do not believe it is the same CPI calc. I think CPI would be much higher if we kept the same calculation we had, let's say, three years ago. Um, but, you know, uh, <laughs> I guess, um, uh, I, I guess uh, that's what our government statistics are, not. Um, not a super fan of that, but um, anyway, and probably every administration does it to some degree. So, but I, a benign number, I think, would, you know, again, that that puts forward policy more certain. And when traders and investors see more certainty in the future, stocks go up and vol comes down. Although, Volatility at this, like it feels like this 12, 12 and a half is kind of the terminal low. Um, but for those watching at home, we're up 14 out of the last 15 weeks, working on the 16th week. And volatility in the SPX, 60 day volatility, is the lowest. It is under 10% right now, 9.98%, I believe. So, um, if you, uh, you know, and the last time we saw realized volatility this low, um, you know, it, <laughs> it 
we we used to laugh that there's no way that Trump is a single digit volatility president. Yet here we are um, going into the elections and we have, you know, the lowest realized ball we have had in. OK, here we are since before COVID. So I'm just saying that's that's what it is, like whether, you know, I don't think the market's going to crash because it certainly doesn't want to for whatever reason. Um, and but lower realized vol tends to lend itself to higher stock prices. Um, like your those intraday moves aren't as big, and this is when they just volatility. You know, in general, uh, people buying puts looking for that that quick sell off, and they're just they get uh, decimated time and time again because uh, they're not getting the sell off. Especially, I mean, look at the last fourteen weeks. So. You know, unless you were unless you were long and own stuff, you just got taken to the woodshed. So, um, and that is the condition we have. But we have not seen realized volatility this low, yeah, since since 2020 pre-COVID. So, um, and it's hard to believe because that feels like a million years ago at this point. Um, but you know, when you look at when you're a vol, you know, kind of, I'm like a sort of a vol geek at this point. Um, it's just, that's, you know, that, that usually leads to, um, higher stock prices. So, and about, I think the CPI will give us a good inkling. And if the number is somewhat in line, like 5,100 and on, on onward and upward is, uh, in the cards. Let's see what's in the cards from the uncle list of Mike's Mr. Uncle Mike, sir. If you have any enduring memories of one Joe Montana, the uh, multi-time Super Bowl MVP, I guess you could say we're all options MVPs here on this show, including all of our listeners. You're all MVPs in our hearts at the end of the day, listeners. But if you have any enduring thoughts, have at it, Mr. Uncle Mike. And B, what's catching your eye in yet an un another Uncle Mike type of day? No doubt. I mean, I was actually very impressed with my Steve McMichael answer, because that's something to where I, I almost pulled that off. And I, I wouldn't have guessed that you would have gone with Joe Montana, but um, I almost did that because there, there was a time before that I, I think I accidentally buzzed and I had to do it and I did guess it right. But um, either way, I think that was uh, Hacksaw, one of the ones we did back in the day. I think you, I think you just threw him out and you got it right. Yes. What prompted you to want to buzz in so ridiculously, some might say, foolishly early? I accidentally did it. I fat fingered an order. And, and that is why all of my clients listening will be happy to know that we have uh, insurance in case I accidentally fat finger an order in that same fashion. So if I put in a 200 lot in your account instead of the 20 lot, we have insurance should, in case something like that should happen. So um, the question to ask your financial advisor, are you insured in case you fat finger an order? And uh, the answer is yes. And uh, right there, it just showed that it is possible to do that. So, uh, but with Joe Montana, I mean, he's Joe cool. I mean, he is uh, someone who, he was part of the offense that changed the way football was played. And you know, for years, I always felt that Steve Young actually was a better quarterback. And in the la in the later years, he was. Uh, but it, and when I say that from being just a fundamental quarterback and that he was a dual threat quarterback, he could run, he could throw, he could do things. But Joe Montana just had a way of winning. I mean, he deserved the job later in his career, no doubt about it. There was a Steve Young, Joe Montana quarterback controversy in San Francisco. And I, I really believe in hindsight and looking back and being the football historian with which I am, had the 49ers decided to trade Steve Young instead of Joe Montana, I mean, they didn't trade him, but they essentially went to the Chiefs. But had they let Steve Young go, I think Joe could have won a few more. Uh, he could have won two or three more in, in San Francisco with the teams that they had and just the way that he was able to lead a team. And uh, he definitely deserves the title of being one of the best ever. No question about that. I mean, like the story that everyone loves to talk about with Joe Montana is in the Super Bowl against the Bengals. Two minutes left. Uh, Joe Montana was so calm that during a commercial break, there they're getting ready to lead the, he's getting ready to do a drive uh, to win the game with two minutes left during a commercial break. And he says to one of his linemen, Hey, is that John Candy in the end zone there? 
And they're talking about John Candy. He was that cool and calm that he could talk to his linemen about John Candy having to stand it, be standing in the end zone of a football game. And so uh, he was definitely someone who was um, very calm. Pressure did not bother him. <laughs> and um, he was he, he was the one who really paved the way for quarterbacks having that ability and being comeback kings and things like that. Other quarterbacks had done it, but not in the way that Joe Montana did. I mean, I'm not trying to take anything away from Bart Starr, Joe Namath, or um, Terry Bradshaw, or some of those great quarterbacks, but they didn't lead a teams and make comebacks the way Joe Montana did. So uh, definitely a lot of respect for old Joe Cool. Anyway, in terms of these markets, yeah, we're above 5,000 right now, and uh, this is getting pretty interesting. So now... Uh, you can view 5,000 as more of like a support level of can the S and P hold 5,000. It's a large, big key number. Uh, that's one thing with which to look at on there. Uh, don't really have a lot of individual names lighting up my tape today per se. I mean, we're up 20 points in the S and P. That's really not that big of a deal anymore because it's at 5,000, 20 points is uh, not even half a percent anymore. And then really not having any major sector, light ups or anything like that. This is a fairly broad based rally. Technology is really not there for the most part. Uh, they're actually the only ones that are up 0.13 percent in looking at it. And um, what's crazy, though, is that Apple is down and the markets up. So Andrew talked about upside down world. This is another example of upside down world. What I'm looking at right now primarily are the yields and that uh, we are getting some selling in the 10 year right now in that uh, the yield has jumped uh, just in the last uh, couple, since the beginning of February, the 10 year, February 1st, the yield on the 10 year was 3.87. Uh, and then as of Friday, it was 4.17. So we're getting some movement to the downside in the 10 year yield. Once again, to clarify, yields go up, values go down and vice versa. Um, and so we do have somewhat kind of sort of slightly more normalization in the rates, but we still don't have a, a curve that is not inverted at all. Uh, for example, the 20 year is still greater than the 30 year and the yield where you're getting the most of all of them is in one year and less. So the one year treasury is at 4.86. This is as of Friday, uh, the six months at 5.2 and the one months at 5.49. So if you want to get the most yield, you invest in the most short-term thing right now. That's a weird thing. A lot of times people say that an inverted yield curve is a predictor of a recession, but it's been inverted for a while now, and we haven't had a recession yet. And so they say that this is going to be the most predicted recession of all time, but um, I don't know. It's kind of interesting in that we've had this inverted yield curve for as long as we have, but we haven't had a recession. So... I'm not sure what's going on with everything from that regard, but as with everything, have a plan in case the bottom drops out at any minute, because uh, it absolutely might. But on the flip side, keep enjoying smoking those cigars lit with $100 bills, because one thing that I would like to say today that Mark and Andrew probably thought I wasn't going to say, do it at the end today, just putting something a little bit different. Never before in the history of the entire stock market has there ever been a better time to sell than right now. Back to you, Mark. Well, thank you for that. So you bring up Apple. I'm going to come back to them in, in a few minutes. I want to get your thoughts on, on what we're seeing out there, because I'm hard-pressed to think of another day that is like this. But before we get there, I'm dial it back. We'll get to Apple in a second and all the single names. Let's go out to the major indices first. And are things popping off in the major indices? In particular, let's start with VIX. The answer is, yeah, VIX banging right now. Almost 550,000 contracts on the tape already in VIX land. That's against an ADV of 725. So VIX on the rampage right now. I'm looking to see what's going up out there right now. 42,000 of the March 17s have gone up for 79 cents. Kind of mid-market, so I'll have to dig a little bit more to see what they're up to there. And March 21s going up 34,000 times. So it didn't go up as a spread. It's not a vertical. It went up hours apart. Those went up for 53 cents, kind of leaning towards the bid. So maybe they legged into a bit of a vertical. By the way, it looks like about 76,000 contracts just in that one print. And then 20,000 of the Feb 13 puts going up for 12 cents. Again, expiring in two days. So a bit of a flyer to the downside. You like those listeners? Paper buying those? Feb 13 puts for 12 cents. Somebody bought 20,000 of them this morning. So 
I know the meatball was talking up some uh, cheapy VIX flyer puts on Volviews on Friday. It looks like somebody playing in that game this week. Are you playing out there? No, in the past, a lot of you have been lured to the dark side of cheapy VIX puts. Uh, it's been a rough game the last couple of weeks, but uh, we'll see. Maybe this one will be the straw that breaks the camel's back. Spy looking about where it normally is, about 4.63 million contracts right now, the ADV 8.6. So Spy looking decent. Same thing for the SS, 1.75 million, the ADV 3.3. Small caps, 1.1 million. So small caps, a banger today as well. We didn't talk about them at the top of the show. Uh, right now, listeners, our old friend IWM, aka the small caps, up nearly 2%, 1.9%. So well north of the uh, 2000 level, 2031, to be precise. So, man, worm turning perhaps in small caps land? Either way, 1.1 million. That is nothing to sneeze at out there. The ADV is only 1.38 million, so they're almost there. And the queues looking surprisingly light. 1.75 million. You know what? Let me just re-rack those queues really quickly. Maybe they put up a little more. Usually they're at about 2.2, at 1.85 million. So, man, that's light actually for the queue. So, again, a weird day. Vix banging, queues kind of languishing, small caps on fire, all sorts of weird stuff. Now let's get to the single names. I'm going to tell you something, listeners, and it's going to surprise you. Are you ready? First off, a whole shakeup in our top 10 today. Dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria, because number 10. Yes, I said number 10. I cannot recall the last time this name was at number 10, maybe ever before in the history, the long history of this show. Number 10 is the fruit company, Apple, barely making it in to the top 10 out there today, listeners. That is, that is kind of bonkers, quite frankly. That's already annihilating the lead that it's a pretty busy day. It cost you 345,000 contracts to break into the top 10. But Mr. Uncle Mike, Mr. Rock Lobster, can either of you, maybe I'm just blanking on it, but can either of you recall another time on the show when Apple was at the number 10 spot, not number two or three or anything like that? That is, we are definitely an upside down world today, that's for sure. Yeah, I can never remember <laughs> seeing I'm, that before. I'm starting, to, I'm starting to get the willies about tomorrow. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a little like, weird. Nothing's going right. I, I, Apple is not in the, is at the bottom of the list. Tucson's losing 80s football <laughs> trivia. I, like, all the listeners should be hiding under their desk tomorrow, is well, what I'm saying. In his defense, he did do something absurdly foolish, and that's what cost him. <laughs> so that's what happened. He, he, you play that well, you game. You know what, though? When, when you had such a dominating streak as he has, he just, he just, I think he was just going for. I can't be wrong, so yeah. I'm not going to worry. You about know, it. a little bit of hubris there. You know, you, you don't even need the question to get the answer. You know, and that's no, what happens. Yeah, he's just like, I, I got this. I got this. He's a tragic Greek hero come to life, and a little hubris. He flew too close <laughs> to the sun, and now he has been. Steve burned. McMichael was a lot closer than you guys <laughs> thought because it's just '80s trivia in general, and I got, I knew it was going to be something football. I was pretty close. You released all things considered. You had the right oeuvre, I'll give you that. But outside of that, yeah, no, uh, unfortunately, a little bit too close to the sun. But yeah, this is a weird one, listeners. I don't, I can't remember another time that this has happened on the show. We've been doing this for a while. Apple all the way. We've seen Apple four, five, even six, ten. I can't recall that ever. Again, that kind of buries the lead that it's actually a banger day on the single names as well. 345,000. Apple, as Uncle Mike alluded to, off nearly a full point right now, about half a percent, trading right around 188. So S&P up when Apple's down. Is this the new paradigm we're living in? Apple is anemic on the volume front and doesn't really drive the market anymore. Is that what's happening now? Is it because everyone wants AI and Apple has some, obviously some uh, dogs in that race, but they're not the leading the vanguard by any means. So yeah, kind of fascinating. Uh, bifurcation of the market. Number nine and another A tech name kind of kicked to the curb as well. Amazon, number nine, 357,000, 173 and about a third off about a one point, one point, 115 or so, about two thirds of a percent. Good for 357,000 contracts and the number nine spot. Number eight, Teva Pharmaceuticals, twelve ninety, up about ninety cents or seven point three percent. Three hundred seventy thousand contracts on the tape. I haven't even looked. I'm going to go ahead and guess that's all just crazy upside. Now the money calls because that's what pharma's do, <laughs> especially on days when they're popping. But uh, interesting stuff there. So yeah, we, we're only at number eight here, listeners, and already we've got a very, very topsy turvy 
maybe a little bit disturbing list. I don't know. This is this is weird. I'm kind of with the Rock Lobster. It's giving me the old heebie-jeebies. Number seven. Now we're starting to get back into more familiar territory. We got Meta, 473.40 or so, up about five and a quarter. Nice day for them, about 1.1%. So again, just the funky names. If that's not enough, beginning with M, ending with A, tickers for you. How about another one right behind it? Mara. Number six, 481,000. Man, Marathon almost back threatening 30 again. 26 and a half bucks right now. Up about two and two thirds or another 11%. This name has been the roller coaster of all roller coasters from about 15, 16 up to about nearly 30, then right back down, cut in half again, and now right back up almost to 30 again. This thing has been just on the rampage of late listeners. So again, if you're looking for some vol and some volume, you could do worse than Mara. We talk about a lot in our crypto rundown show. It's got... Not that far away from an ADV perspective. It's not that far away from VIX. VIX is about 723. Marathon was over 600K not too long ago. So Marathon putting up some numbers out there. Uh, and again, good for number six today, 481. Number five, going back to A, tech names, or in this case, chip names, AMD, 175.60, up about $3.10, up 1.8%. Good for 542,000 contracts. And the number five spot, number four, keeping it in A tech, man, A's. Dominating the list, Amazon, Apple, AMD, and now number four. Is this a sign of things to come? Is ARM moving into our top 10 to stay? ARM, number four, 569, keeping up there. My goodness, keeping up this rampage. It was up 50% on one session last week. Up another 22 handles or about almost 20% today, trading 137.85. My goodness, over the last five days, it is up 83.5% or 62 handles. It was trading $76 back last Wednesday. It is now threatening 140 listeners. My goodness, 542,000. And the number five, number four spot, I should say, 569,000. Number three, going back to a name we have at least seen before on the top 10 a little bit. This is Palantir, 584,000. Again, is this, is this another name that's maybe moving on up? Like the Jeffersons kicking some names like Apple to the curve. 2462, up about a quarter today. The Rock Lobster was going on about oddities a couple of weeks ago saying, man, I, I really want this. Looking for another move in Palantir. Well, you got it over the last couple of weeks. It's popped pretty hard. Number three, 584. Number two, yes, number two. Again, another day. Just topsy-turvy all over the place. When's the last time something kicked Tesla to the curb? Well, that happened today. Tesla, 1.26 million, continuing to sell off, 188.70. You know what? Apple and Tesla, not looking that dissimilar, at least from a stock price perspective right now. Obviously, market cap, a very different beast. Might be a fun question of the week. Which one would you rather have in your back pocket right now? A little bit of a fun question. Off nearly five bucks today, or two and a half percent. So the ongoing China woes and price, you know, price war issues going on out there in EVs continuing to weigh on Tesla. Uh, 1.26. And then number one, listeners, you don't need me to tell you. Maybe, again, maybe this is the sign of the warm turning out here. NVIDIA taking the top spot today. 1.3 million. NVIDIA only up a dollar. Trading 722. These levels just look insane. But that's where we are right now. 1.3 million. My goodness. This is a... This might be a, a sea change moment here, listen. We'll see if this persists. It could just be a fluke. But if this persists, this is the new era. Apple kicked to the curb in favor of NVIDIA. Tesla getting knocked down a bit. Palantir and ARM and AMD all on the rampage. And maybe Mara. Mara probably a little bit more wishy-washy, depending on the price of, of Bitcoin. But still, maybe a bit of a sea change out here, listen. Interesting stuff. Uh, we got hot names popping off this week. Coke, Tomorrow, Marriott, Hasbro, Airbnb, and the old hood, Robin Hood. I'm talking about them in a while. Wednesday, uh, some folks you might know on the network, CME, as well as Cisco, Uncle Mike's favorite. Thursday, we got Rubber Shoes, a.k.a. Crocs. We got John Deere. We got Yeti. We got Wendy's, DraftKings, Coinbase. Man, Roku, AMAP. Oh, Synovus. This is one we were talking about for a while. Cave, CVE. We'll finally find out if that paper paid off. Uh, hot stuff out there right now. Uh, in terms of the season, we are hanging out right now because we got to get rolling. We're already having a lot of fun here on the show, but we got to get rolling. Uh, right now, listeners, we are hanging out for the season 127%. So, bit of a banger. Let's see if the odd block is a banger because it's coming up next. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block.
All right, everybody, let's get weird. Let's get wild. Uh, Mr. Rocklops, I'll put it up to you. Do you want to pay off some stuff? You want to talk about some new stuff? What do you feel like? Well, let, let's pay off. Let's pay off one. All right. um, yeah, I know which one you're talking Let's pay off about. one and then let's talk about some new stuff just because, like, uh, you know, it. <laughs> All right, we, we got to go to. Interesting to see what new sort of flow is about. New right flow. Now. Well, we got to pay off this one. We've been waiting for a bit. Since the show last week, we talked about size prints in Carrier. You know them, HVAC. We were kind of saying on the show, what, what the hell? The HVAC, really? Not exactly the sexiest of sectors, but we saw what looked like an enormous put spread. The 55 50 put spread going up 13,500 times. We also saw five minutes before it, someone also buying about 4,100 of the Feb 60s, paying 60 cents for those. So there was a whole bunch of pre-earnings flow. Earnings came up the next day. So we said we would know by the Thursday show, certainly by today, we would know how these are paying off. And the put spread, 55.50, they put it up for 75 cents, 95 cents on the 55s, 20 cents on the 50s. We went back and forth. The Flowmaster, I believe, was in the chat last week when we were doing this. We were kind of debating whether or not they bought or sold these. Uh, either way, it doesn't really matter because it doesn't. they didn't last too long on this put spread. Well, the stock sold off to 53.37 pretty much right away post-earnings. And then when they put it up, it was 56.59. And they ended up taking this spread off for 71 cents the very next day. So they put it on for 75 cents, and they took it off for 71 cents. So they saw the writing on the wall. They pretty much scratched it, made or lost four cents. Not really a big deal. But whoever put that put spread on, Failed on it really quickly. But what's interesting is that the calls were, and indeed, last I checked, are still open. The Feb 60s. The stock right now, 56.11. So, spoiler alert, these are not looking great. They're still open and they kind of suck. So, it looks like they're probably going to drop around a quarter of a million bucks on the call. So, Mr. Rock Lobster, it's like they took a bit of a flyer with the put spread, but weren't willing to play too long with that. I took it off literally the next day, right after the earnings for about a scratch. And then looks like there's someone is still riding the calls and those are looking no bueno, sir. Is that your takeaway as well? So they, they basically it, I, yeah, I kind of feel like they got, I think they're sort of duration stuck on this one. So they're not, they're not going to get anything out of the 60 calls. It appears and it looks like they were, they got out of the puts for something. Um, so, I mean, you know, they should have made some money on the puts, the put spread, though. But I guess they just didn't, they didn't get, their timing wasn't great. Excellent. Four cents. They bailed on it the next day. Yeah. So, yeah, this was like, you know, I think we remarked on it. It's kind of hard to to buy options in a, you know, in an industrial name with such a short <laughs> time frame. Unless, of course, you know something. Unless you're a, unless you're a member of Congress and have the inside dope on what's going to happen to you know <laughs> uh, the uh, the you know the uh, uh, the air conditioning industry. You know they might pass a law. We can't have air conditioning anymore. You know, too environmentally unfriendly. Yeah, I'm looking right now. It looks like they did a total actually of about 7,500 of those Feb 60s on the day. Uh, so those are all still open. So they are actually choking on more than a quarter of a million dollars with a premium there. So those obviously they're not expired yet. Nothing is done. But as of right now, the stock needs to make a pretty Herculean move by expiration for those bad boys to pop off. Let's keep on rolling out to a name that is a newcomer to us here on the old odd block. This is Soundhound AI Inc. Does that just sound like the most just... Slap together buzzword nonsense name. Soundhound AI. Gotta have AI in there somewhere, right? Ticker symbol Sound, S O U N. Trading 230 today, up $2.30, not $230, listeners. Uh, up about three cents. So kind of a, a rounding error day today. On the year, let's see, it's been topsy turvy. A year ago, they were trading three and a quarter. So they're off about a buck on the year, nearly 30%. They crushed them the first time back in the contagion fears down to a buck 49. Then they rallied it all the way up to four, actually 511 in June. So they went from a buck 49 to 511. So they had a nice run. And then they gave it all back by October again. They were trading right around a buck and a half again, right around Halloween. And then since then, they've managed to rally it. Looks like most of this actually has come over the last week. They were trading a buck 70 about 10 days ago. And now they've popped in the last five days. Uh, they've popped what looks like about close to 50 cents. Let's see. Yeah, 65 cents or nearly 40% over the last five days. So they've had a nice pop 
over the last five days. This is voice AI and speech recognition company founded in 2005. So way beyond or way ahead of, I should say, the uh, AI boom. Sounds like a little bit like a dragon naturally speaking kind of thing out here. But uh, yeah, that's what we got here. Mr. Rock Lobster, if today's paper is to be believed, this recent pop, uh, people are maybe thinking, uh, maybe no bueno, maybe not going to be hanging out for long. because We saw a massive block of 5,000 of the March 24 puts. Paper looks like they were gobbling these bad boys up for about 23 cents. And they came back about 2,700 more for 25 cents. And they also got 1,800 off for about 20 cents. So they traded a whole bunch. Let's see. These were all, yeah, all at the same time. So it looks like they swept them. Uh, they started off at, uh, you know, 20 cents and then up to 23 and then 25. Uh, so, yeah, just a big sweep of puts. The two puts expiring in March. I guess they're, they're not feeling the love, Mr. Rock Lobster. Obviously, they're sitting on a bunch of shares probably. Probably a little worried about giving it up. Paying a decent amount. You're talking about, it for the 23 cent kind, exactly 10% of the value of the stock to hedge through March, sir. What say you? Uh, well, as we said before, the buyers of these puts in these $2 names have been strangely prescient over the last, <laughs> uh, the last year. But this has to be the only stock with AI in its name that is down. From uh, from what I can see, yes, Soundhound AI. Um, uh, maybe they just, they think it's uh on its way out of being a going concern. I mean, thirty eight million. It's got like something. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe it's they're just kind of slowly running out of cash or something. Um, but from a you know from a trading point of view, um. Like you, there's, there's, they're buying one and a half puts. They're buying two puts. They bought these two puts. So they're definitely looking for, you know, I don't know, buck and a half dollar on the stock, which, you know, could easily happen. So, um, but it does, it has, I mean, these aren't, these do not look like line in the sand puts. They look like these are gloom and doomers for the stock. Yeah. 10% of the value of the stock. You got to be a little bit concerned over the next couple of months. So yeah, that little pop in AI. Maybe they're thinking uh, we're, we're catching this tailwind. We're going to try to keep what we can. But uh, intriguing stuff. Let's get out of here on this one. This is Coupang Inc. Ticker symbol CPNG. E-commerce company out of South Korea. Up 60 cents trading 15.06 today. Uh, on the year, they got as high as about exactly 20 bucks and a low of 12.66. I'm kind of speeding through this because I want to get to all of this. You may remember this one, listeners. We talked about him back on the May 25th show. We talked about the Coupang Callpalooza. Someone came in and bought almost 10,000, 9,669 of the June 17s for 29 cents when the stock was not that far from here, 1572. They came back, liked it so much, they did a total of 18,000 on the day. Uh, they paid 29 cents for these, Mr. Rock Lobster, and the stock went out 1728 on expiration. <laughs> so they exactly scratched on their calls. Uh, again, total of 18,000. So actually, there were a total of 26,000 open on the strike on expiration. So they were. They're wearing it on this stock now because they ended up becoming the proud owners of a whole bunch of Coupang stock. They held these calls through expiration. If they're still owning it on that first 10,000 lot, obviously they're off about two bucks on the stock right now. So over two million bucks there. Multiply that times all the OI. That could be a bit of an ouchie. Uh, but either way, Mr. Rock Lobster, it seems like somebody's going back to the well, maybe tilting at that windmill again today. Somebody coming in this morning scooping 4,375 of the May 16s, going out a little bit of a ways this time. And spending a buck oh six on them when the stock was right about here, they come back and did a total of 13,000 now on the day. So we have had a swing for the fences call trader in the past on this name, Mr. Rock Lobster. It did not work out. Maybe the same person coming again. I mean, it's not that dissimilar size at the end of the day. Different strike levels, though, and different premium levels. So it doesn't have to be the same person, but it is eerily reminiscent paper. What do you think? Think they have a shot the second time around, sir, and everyone's favorite? Korean e-commerce name, Coupang. <laughs> you know, and this has been around for us for a little bit. Um, yes. You know what? I, I overall, I like Korea, it seems again, kind of like, it seems like a country that's run relatively well, although they always seem to have some sort of like huge, like almost uh, like, uh, like a soap opera-esque 
end to whoever their like premier or president or something like that. They had like this huge political intrigue where it was like the Samsung family guy or this or that, or it always seems like one of their premiers ends up going to jail because of corruption. I don't know what the deal is, but the country itself seems to work pretty good. Um, except for that North Korean problem they got just north. But um uh in general I'm I'm kind of bullish like like country ETF and all that kind of stuff uh on this one. But this I'm just seeing to see here if so you had that early love and then now I don't think this is again you have May May calls you got four months to expert. Hard to believe it's only four months away. Uh, let's say you got February, March, April. Yeah, we're well, like four months away. And, you know, the stock just moved 61 cents and these calls are only a dollar. So they, they, number one, they're price performers. And number two, they are passing the one day sniff test. So, I think this is a to be watch, man. Somebody, somebody could be, uh, somebody's looking to make some bucks in this one. And you know who else is always to be watched, unless it's, of course, in our trivia game when he buzzes in crazy early? It's Uncle Mike. So let's get to him now. A little bit of the old strategy block. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for the strategy block. All right, Uncle Mike, you got about eight minutes to regale us on optimal buzzing strategy. Go, sir. The floor is yours. <laughs> Don't do what I did. <laughs> That's pretty much it right there. Um, let's talk today about reallocation because of the fact that something that you may want to consider right now with your overall portfolio Uh an example of reallocation is let's say that you've worked with your financial advisor and let's say that you've determined that you want 60% of your money in stocks, 40% of your money in bonds, the traditional 60-40 allocation. Well, one thing that needs to be mentioned is that if you have a year like we did last year, let's say you start out right at 60-40 and January 1st, 2023, and you did nothing throughout the whole year. Well, it's very likely that your portfolio is much greater than 60-40. It's probably 70% stocks, 30% bonds, something like that, just because stocks moved up as much as they did. Now, if your strategy dictates that you want to continue to have a 60-40 portfolio, you need to do something called reallocating, meaning that you need to sell enough of your stocks and buy enough of your bonds to get back to that 60-40 level. Now, of course, the disadvantage of that would be if the market continues to go higher, you won't participate as much. But the advantage is, is that you're taking a little bit off the table. And if we have a pullback, it won't hurt you as badly, most likely. Nothing's promised, of course, but it's something with which to consider. What I really want to highlight today is sequence of return risk when using reallocation. So for example, let's say that you had all your money in stocks in 2022, or all your money in bonds for that matter. Well, if you had to take money out to pay your bills, let's say you're retired and you're looking to pay your bills because uh, you need that money to live on, you missed out on all of 2023 with that money. And whether you are buying more, selling, whatever the case may be, whenever you sell a stock and you're going to use that money to live off of, you're never going to get any more gains out of that stock as long as you live with that money because you already spent it. So what I want to make a case for right now, and this is something that I like to work with my clients, uh, is using covered calls as a tool within the retirement portfolio when you are in the distribution phase. So in other words, Let's say that you have 60% stocks, 40% bonds based on your risk scores or whatever way your advisor's looking to put you into whatever he's looking to do. If the market goes down, and if we have another year like 2022, let's say, and you need some of that money to live off of, you're not getting it back because you already had to take it out to live off of it. Something that I believe 
can work very well if you are in the distribution phase of retirement, meaning you're taking money to live off of, are covered calls. Now, whether you should do an in-the-money call, at-the-money call, out-of-the-money call, you sell call spreads or whatever, that's a whole other strategy block, but I think this can be a valuable tool. So let's oversimplify everything for a, a second. Let's say that one of your allocations, whether you're considering it part of the 60 or halfway 60, halfway 40, based upon your risk, whatever the case may be, as a covered call is not monetarily as risky as just owning a stock. If the market goes down, and let's say that you took in 10% premium on the year in that covered call, if the market goes down, that 10% premium that you took in throughout the year, maybe you're doing 1% a month, maybe you're just selling one long one for the year, one every six months, whatever the case may be, but 10% on a stock over the course of a year in a covered call is not outlandish by any means, that premium that you took in can act as your grocery money or as your uh, living money, your car payment, whatever the case may be, you can do that. If you put all of your money into fixed income or CDs once you retire, now maybe if you're 98 years old, then that's fine. But once you retire, let's say you retire at age 60, most people are going to live another 20 to 30 years. If you don't have exposure to the stock market for that time, you're going to ultimately lose to inflation most likely, unless you have just buku bucks to where you don't care. However, if you just put all your money in the market, well, you have sequence of return risk with which I just described. 60-40 portfolios are great. 70-30s are great. Not trying to take anything away from them. But the tool that can act as the bridge within retirement financing, my opinion, it's very important, is that of a covered call. And that is my strategy block for today. Last one before Valentine's Day. Now it's time for us to keep on rolling and go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to Around the Block, of course, the portion of the show where we tell you what we're keeping an eye on around the block. We did just post a fun. I mentioned we might do it earlier on the show. We did just post a fun, kind of half tongue-in-cheek question of the week. Tesla and Apple both trading right around $188 right now, which raises the question... Gun to your head, which one you rather buy right now? I gave you four choices to mix it up a little bit. Obviously, Apple or Tesla, or I'll stick with crypto, or for all you vol mongers out there, I'll stick with Vic slash vol. Right now, it is exactly even, a third each for Apple, Tesla, and crypto. No love for VIX. Again, it just went live a few minutes ago. We'll keep an eye on this throughout the week. We'll also keep an eye, obviously, on a bunch of earnings out there. We have people writing in asking us to talk about uh, Coke earnings and all that fun. I'm not sure if that's going to make it on the show here today, listeners, but maybe we'll be able to come back to it. Yeah, they're, they're popping off tomorrow before the bell really quickly because we're coming up against it here <laughs> for the listener who asked. Uh, Coke is right about 60 bucks right before showtime. They're 59 and a half when we ran this report. They were pricing in a buck 48 in the past. They've moved 78 cents. So Coke is pricing in a banger earnings cycle right now that's a lot of juice 2x what they've moved in the past coke again not normally known for outperformance moves not a name we usually talk about on the show that often but maybe maybe our listener is on to something maybe we should keep more of an eye on coke this week unfortunately we're coming up against it mr rock lobster we'll start with you sir what are you keeping an eye on until the thursday show uh well one um a cpi number that's a big one tomorrow uh, if we can get continue this uh, like inflation steadying trend would be good. I think the market will like it a lot. Uh, and you know, Nvidia earnings the next week. I mean, uh, can it go to 800, 900, a thousand? How high can the bulge broke bracket firms jack up the expectations on that? Um, and my guess is pretty high <laughs> All right now. And Mr. Uncle Mike, uh, what are you keeping an eye on till the Thursday show? And how much of a laser focus will you put on Coca-Cola earnings, sir? Can't say much on Coca-Cola, uh, but I'll watch it. I have some people in Coke, but um, nothing too close. I mean, what I'm watching right now, I, from an individual name standpoint, just watching Apple, seeing if it can 
at some stage, somehow, some way, break through 200 and break through the $3 trillion market cap level. So uh, not really watching. That's not a big part of what I'm watching, but uh, let's talk about something sexy. It's Apple, right? <laughs> Yeah, Coke, unless you're Warren Buffett, I don't think anyone ever considered it sexy. But you know what? That vol number does have my eyebrows raised. I might be paying more attention to Coke this cycle than I have in the past. Is there some juice, pun intended, to be found out there in Coca-Cola? Well, we'll find out tomorrow. Maybe we'll have a chance to talk about it later on Thursday show. Unfortunately, it's all the time we got for today. But before we go, let's go back around the horn. Mr. Uncle Mike, if folks want to debate Coke's earnings with you in depth, where should they go? What should they do? Feel free to give me a call. Set an appointment on my website, stcharleswealth.com, and follow me on Twitter at Mike Tusaw, T O S A W. Reach out to him, tell him, stop with the buzzing before the question, Uncle Mike. You're killing me. Send him that feedback at Mike Tusaw. All one word on Twitter is the place to go to send him your just direct message thoughts. Just bombard him with that. He'll appreciate it. Listeners. And Mr. Rock Lobster, where should folks go if they want more Rock Lobster goodness or to congratulate you? on an early victory here in the 80s wrestling trivia game yeah <laughs> yeah don't expect those too often um <laughs> 888 trade zero one if you heard this year's show you get 10 percent off any option pit products say andrew said so and that should work and uh that is what we got so we'll uh we'll see what happens We'll see what happens. Indeed, I said 80s wrestling obviously is now a broad 80s trivia game, so hope you're having fun playing along. Going to do it for us on the old OB. If you're listening live, hang out. We'll be back in a little bit with the Crypto Rundown with some fun guests joining me to break down all the madness going on in the crypto world. And, of course, if you saw our uh, top 10 from earlier, Mara lighting it up, so obviously a lot going on out there. Speaking of which, looks like you folks are battling away right now in our question of the week. Tesla now taking it 38.5%, 30.8% for Apple, 23.1% for crypto, and only 7.7% coming in for VIX slash Vol. Just went live, listeners. Get in there, add options, make your voice heard. Back in a little bit with the crypto rundown. Back again with our usual array of content throughout the rest of the week until we're back again on Thursday for episode two of the Option Block. Stay safe out there, everybody. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>